Goedemorgen aan allemaal wat vanochtend hier die rechtstreeks uitzien en kijk. Good morning to everybody that is watching this live stream this morning. Today it is my privilege to introduce two guests into the Afri Forum sitting room. On my right is Khosi Gabo Moroka, Khosi of the Barulongbo Seleka traditional community of Tabanshu east of Bloemfontein. And next to Khosi is Willem Grobler from Julko Square. Welcome to Afri Forum. Khosi, I want to start the conversation by asking you to just give us a, a brief background on the, on the road that Afri Forum and yourself, the royal family and Barulong Boseleka traveled on, maybe we can say the last three or so years. Um, thank you very much, Parent, and greetings to the viewers as well. I'm not sure if I can say brief, um, but um, I'll, I'll try to summarize. So we know that we, the Afrikaners and Barolombo Seleka tribe have a long history together um, from the battles of the 18, early 1800s um, when my forefathers actually rescued um, the Afrikaner nation at a battle of Fekhkop. But also uh, one interesting fact, or maybe two, is that um, we, the, all the great treks in, in within the country passed through Tabanchu, except one that I think the one of uh, Henrik Potriter, if I'm not, Richard. oh, Louis Richard, my, my apologies. And um, it's also uh, where Tabanchu is also where the, the governments were formed, uh, where we, we speak about the Cape colonies. And so there's a rich history. And it, 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 I see it as this um, relationship now that we have is history repeating itself. Because at a time when we were under siege as Barolombo Seleka, uh, the, the family that had been recognized for uh, over a centuries, nearly sen uh, two centuries, was dethroned. Um, it was the 2nd of January 2020 when I received a call from Afri Forum to say, we have read the uh, open letter that you have written to the president of the country about the situation um, you are faced with as, as the royal ruling royal family or recognized ruling royal family. And that's where the journey started. So um, we've had our ups and downs. We've had, it's been such a heartwarming journey. Um, personally, it is in honor of our forefathers um, that's how deeply rooted I, I perceive it and the, the entire family perceives it that, you know, some things on earth are beyond us. Uh, some things are divine and we need to respect such things. So um, that's where we are. We, we fought this battle and victory uh, was realized um, this year, March this year with the um, Supreme Court of Appeal. And here we are today, the, that very same family has um, now gone back and is now on the throne again through the partnership with Afri Forum. Uh, thank you, Khosi. I think for the benefit of, of everybody listening, um, I can add a few details. So of course, the, the big leader we are actually speaking about is Khosi Moroka II, and it was after the Battle of Fagkop in October 1836, um, when the four trackers there were completely destitute, all the track oxen um, were taken away and they were stuck on the battlefield. And this is when Khosi Moroka came to their aid. He sent track oxen for the track party to move back to the safety of Tabanshu. And of course, the government we are speaking about is the, the first four tracker government that was democratically elected by the four trackers was elected at Tabanshu. And this is also not well known, but there's actually a monument at the site called Moroka's Hook that commemorates this election of the first four tracker government. And of course, 
it could be done in that area because it was safe. That was the, that was the, the simple reason. Then there's also the history afterwards. Of course, we know in the, in the 1850s, the Republic of the Orange Free State was established. And then again, there was cooperation between Barulong Boseleka under the leadership of Kosi Moroka II, um, and also under the leadership of Kosi Chipinari in the, the battles of the 1800s, which in those days was mostly on the one side, the Afrikaners of the Orange Free State and the Barulong Boseleka, and on the other side, the, the Basutu. And, and then, of course, came the, came the, the 2000s and the 2020s. Um, and we also started a small agricultural project, Josi. Maybe I think you can just also touch on that. Uh, thank you very much uh, for that, uh, Barant. Um, very important to also mention that the cooperation that we have with AfriForum does not, was not just at a level of uh, the dispute that was there, but uh, more importantly, I think for us, it is how we see, we build the f a future that we all want to see, that our forefathers would be proud of, and that is promoting self-sufficiency within our communities. And we started off with uh, a pilot project in one of the villages which I was heading at that time, uh, Nohas Post Village in Tabanchu, where we have an agricultural program um, of 56 hectares of land um, and two hectares of vegetables. Uh, and it has been also uh, a very heartwarming journey, as I say, to see us, you know, uh, breaking those barriers and, and trying to illustrate that it is possible to build the South Africa that we want to build and the importance of um, the communities taking charge of their own development. And that's where I, I think we, we are in agreement that we want to walk this journey together because that is our common goal. Yes, Kosi, and um, when we talk about communities and community-based projects and things like self-sufficiency, um, I think what distinguishes our approach is it's a long-term approach. Um, for unfortunately, we are sitting in a situation where many communities and individual members of communities actually fell into the trap of dependency, very specifically government dependency. Um, and of course, if you've been or if you are used to receiving money or food, for instance, without working, of course, it, it's got an impact on you. And then, of course, it takes quite a big mind shift to say, well, I actually do not want to be dependent. I actually want to be self-sufficient. I want to know how to look after myself. I want to utilize that is available to me to generate an income, to, to generate wealth, and to go from where we are now, and I think we, we can all be honest. I mean, we are facing very big challenges in, in rural South Africa, in the small villages, but of course you need to say, we are here now, we acknowledge the fact, how can we get there? And of course, one part of how can we get where we want to go is to say, we do not have to walk the journey alone. We can also walk the journey, collaborate on the basis of mutual recognition and respect. Um, of course, Kosi, if we speak about an uh, agricultural launch project in a village that is located on a farm, we are talking about the utilization of land in a traditional area. So maybe it would be good for you to just to explain to us how does the allocation and the utilization of land in a traditional area work? And maybe you can use the specific example in the case of Barulong Boseleka in Tabanchu. How does that work? Okay, uh, Baron, thank you very much. I'm tempted to also input, if I'm permitted, on your previous question, uh, our discussion. I just wanted to say before uh, responding to this question that, you know, at the end of the day, uh, the s dependency syndrome we need to work on and the mindset shift, and that's very important um, for our people to understand that even before the current times, we were independent, we were self-sufficient. Um, I always say God, when God created the earth, he gave us all the tools. He gave us land, hands, uh, brains, 
and, and everything else to, to make life for ourselves. And that's the spirit that we need to plant and embed in our people. Uh, now coming to answering your question. In, so Barolombo Selega, let me say the, the system of traditional leadership, but I'll, I'll make an example with Barolombo Selega in particular, how we administer land. Yes, it is um, true that communal land, so land under the administration of traditional leaders, is basically different portions of farms that we, that we have. And in those farms, then we have villages that we've um, established. Tavanchu, for instance, we have 42 villages, and 32 of them are more in the rural setup, and uh, about 10 of them are within what we call the urban edge, so it would be wall-to-wall -wall administration with the municipality. However, um, remember this is a system that's been there for centuries. Um, so what happens is that we have our own um, planning system where we have our own households, uh, sites, household sites, and then we also have the grazing areas within um, the, the villages. And we have, we, we operate with what we call PTOs, permission to occupy, um, where we would then allocate you come, if for instance, Barrent comes and says, Kosi, uh, I'd like to be a resident, um, or goes to a headman in a particular village, then the headman would listen on merit if he or she qualifies. Um, afterwards, then at some a certain point, they call a community meeting to also inform. So the system, our indigenous system, is a consultative system, and we then the the headman or headwoman in that village, together with the community, would then agree from there or disagree. From there, then they take it to Khotla, uh, the traditional authority, where now the Khosi, through the administrative process that's there, um, then uh, uh, um, appoints or gives the site out. Uh, and then we give them that certificate to show um, that, or a contract to show that. What are the challenges faced by the traditional authority um, and the communities? Um, and maybe just f um, for people to gather a bit of understanding, if we are talking about the farmland of Barulongo Seleka, we are talking about approximately 80,000 hectares. So this is an extensive piece of land. So maybe if you can just mention a few of the challenges experienced in this process of, of allocation of land. Um, I th so you, you are speaking correctly so that we are speaking about vast areas um, of land and the management thereof is very important. Now, when you, we would first start by saying times evolve or times change and you need to remain relevant with the, the, the evolution of, of time and the systems that are in place now. We, what has changed is that with the new uh, dispensation, then we also need to find ourselves performing within uh, the framework of, uh, of the law of the country. And <coughs> sometimes that, um, you know, our systems, for instance, the issue of PTOs where um, they are not really recognized. Um, there's that uh, conversation going on vis-a-vis uh, -vis title deeds. But however, to effectively and efficiently ensure that our areas are well managed, we do not have systems in place that ensure the effective and optimal uh, that the land and, and the space that we have is used optimally but not just optimally for the l correct land use, you know? Uh, we, we speak about now as, as uh, royal leaders, we speak about invest rural, we speak about be, uh, being developmental monarchs. Now, you cannot attain the vision and the mission if your foundation, which is the systems that are in place uh, being, being in, you know, uh, also efficient and, and being in place. Right now, we still operate in, in the old system of doing things. 
Um, and it's a challenge because we, we need really to be um, upbeat and in with, with the times. Thank you, Khosi. Um, Willem, I think my, my next question will be, will be directed at you. So we, through our experience and the, and the wonderful um, opportunities AFRI Forum had to collaborate with many different traditional leaders and traditional communities, we came to, to understand, or at least maybe I can say to start to understand the system of traditional leadership, um, the complexity of it, um, and maybe one can also say the, the different levels, because in, in some communities, for instance, you will have, um, and I'm, I'm going to use the English word, so you will have a king, and you will have chiefs, and you will have headmen and headwomen, and there's a certain level of responsibility on every level, and part of those responsibilities is, for instance, the, the allocation of land. But it is really difficult, especially if you talk about vast tracts of land. Firstly, to know where, where are these farms. Mm. Then the second thing is to know but what portions are still available and what portions are not available. One needs to think about how do I plan this land because there are pieces of land that are not utilized. Um, do I want to allocate this for future agricultural development or light industrial development or residential development? Um, but of course, one must have a system that speaks to the reality of traditional leadership. And the reality of traditional leadership is in a village, a headman or a headwoman is responsible for the allocation of land. Of course, there is a process and there's coordination with the, um, with the traditional authority. Um, and this is, Willem, of course, when the paths of Afri Forum and Julko Square, where the paths crossed. Um, and this is actually, the, I think, uh, quite a big announcement today, is where we said, well, we said, we heard everybody criticizing um, traditional leadership, traditional leadership structure, um, different models of ownership of land. But nobody was offering a solution to say, let's provide a system that can support to address the challenges. So Willem, I think, let me give the floor to you and explain what was this or what is this land management system or platform that was development in this partnership between Afri Forum and Jolko Square. Yes, thank you, Baran. I think the most important thing that we try to accomplish with this platform is not to force traditional leaders to take on a new method of operation. We realize that they already have their established ways of doing things. There are multiple levels we need to get some sort of system in place that actually strengthens their current ways of working and not try to change their current ways of working. Now, because of that, we, I mean, I looked all over the world, different type of platforms and Africa is unique. Um, so we quickly realized that it's not gonna work to say, you know what, let's just take something that works somewhere else in the world and try to force it into South Africa to fill that gap that we currently have between the title deed office and the traditional leader's way of permission to occupy. And that's really where the e-title idea was born out of, to say, okay, how do we connect what we have on the one end, which is the title deed, and what we have on the complete other end, which is the permission to occupy. How can we take that permission to occupy and actually, I want to say change it, but strengthen it so that it can be used as a form of identification, that it can be used, let's say for instance at a bank, to say this is where I reside, this is where I work, this is the piece of land that I have permission to use. That permission can be a short-term permission, it can be generational, multi-generational, um, but we need to find a way to basically connect these two ends. And that's what we try to solve with the e-title platform is to say, okay, we put ev all the steps in place, we take the data, which is already available from government side on a top level. Um, the Chief Survey General's office have mapped all the larger areas. Um, the title deed office have also connected the maps with the owners, traditional leaders, but we need to delve deeper and we need to do it in such a way that it's easy to be used. It doesn't help that we have this super complex system that only a handful of people can, can work with. 
and the system needs to be dynamic in nature so that we can, when moving forward, as new challenges arise, as we identify, like you said previously, Baron, we're also still learning. We're realizing every day what is the processes, how is the operations of working, to see how we can pull that into the system to make the system better to serve the end users. Thank you, Vernon. Maybe if you can give us a quick run through, give yes. us a demonstration. Yes, I will do so. Um, yeah, just a quick view on the system itself. So the e-title platform, it's an uh, online application. It's basically, everything runs on there. Um, it was developed with the idea to say it must function within Africa with a lot of our limitations in terms of internet connectivity, those type of setups. And most importantly, be very simple to use. So every user that we have on the platform, we can accommodate different levels of users. Um, we have a username and password com that protects the data, make sure the privacy, everything is in place. And then from there, we have put in all the title areas that that specific person has access to. Now, in this specific instance, we can see the Barreling area. Um, we can see the map there with all the different breakdowns. Uh, what makes this a very unique and interesting example is it's actually broken down into multiple smaller farms. It's not just one big area, and that's where a lot of the challenges comes in. We cannot just treat it as one large area and subdivide it accordingly. Um, even though they are connected, when we try to build that chain up to the government level, we need to realize that each one of those properties are seen as individual properties by the South African government in terms of a title deed. So yeah, just quickly, uh, the interface, we try to keep it as simple as possible. Basically have a place where you can search for places. That is just for quick reference, looking up different towns just to find yourself on the map. Also looking up different properties that we have drawn in. Um, the search system is there in place just for simplistic sake. Then my properties, I'll delve into this a bit later in detail. The my blue zones are also delve into this. And then the most important thing is the green zones. So what we've done here with the idea behind a green zone is to say we need to have the link between our system and the title deed office system. And that is where the green zone comes into place. Now, the green zone is drawn up with information from land server office, and it is, has all the title deed information. There you will see when I click on a specific property, it actually shows all the information for that section. Uh, this page I'm showing here only has limited data. We can further expand it um, with a lot more information regarding additional documents, uh, documents of ownership, all those type of things. Now this is the first level and the most important level in terms of the e-title system because this is the link between government and our platform. So everything builds from this green zone moving downwards. So if I go to the specific property, I want to show you that we can click on any property and I can subdivide it. Uh, there's currently option to subdivide into my property and the blue zone. I don't want to go into the details about a blue zone, but that is basically a smaller allocated area, as you were referring to earlier for agricultural purposes, those type of setups that can also then be allocated to a u another user, let's say, head, um, of that area and he can then do the subdivisions within that area. But for today's demonstration purposes, just want to show you how to draw a property and just how easy it is to draw a property. Basically click on it. For this instance, I want to just draw it on the map. So I click draw marker and I place this marker where I want to on that specific map. Um, I can have the GPS locations. I'll show you that now and I can just add all the, the points. Now that's just a small area that I just draw up. I can move the, the markers around and I can edit it and add more points to it. What's very important that I want to show you is when I click outside of that boundary, it immediately gives me an error saying, you know what, it needs to be within that property because I'm subdividing that property. 
can also add, remove, edit. I can have a satellite view as an overlay. If it just makes it easier for this purpose, I just created the small, easy to identify area. Once that is done, I've subdivided that property on the system. Now when I go back to my properties that was empty at the start of this presentation, I can now go back and see there is the property that I've just subdivided. It is a new property on the system. Onto this property I can link different users and more importantly, I can actually see the information for this property. Now, just a quick side view before I go into the information. I want to show you here there's different ways of actually capturing the points. We can click on a map, we can enter it manually, or if you're using your cell phone, it can use the GPS within the phone to actually capture that information. Since I'm on the computer here right now, it does not have a GPS, so I cannot use that functionality, but it does offer that different type of solutions, whatever is needed. Now, the important thing is the information from this new property that I've just created. As I previously stated, it is a link. Everything is linked to the green zone area. Now, as you can see in this example here, I basically have a breakdown that says this property is linked to this green zone, which is linked to the government side. As we now add more information or break this property down even into smaller sections, this link will just continue to expand and expand and expand, thus making a longer chain, but always connecting the property to the original title lead. Now, just to quickly show you how we actually use this property. Now, we have contracts, leases, and leases. Now, that's a very important setup when we look into actually assigning this property to an individual for use. Now, the way this thing is set up is to say that the owner of the property, he will be the leaser. So, whoever owns a property according to government records, we can capture their information on the screen. Um, as you can see in this example that I've just opened right now, I have the option to enter a company or an individual's information. I can add onto this any type of document that I want. It can either be a photocopy of the person's identification document, or it can be a registration number for the company, the trust, whatever we want to. After we've created the leasee, we must also create the leaser. Sorry, other way around. Um, it's just basically the same setup, just creating it again. Now, the important thing when we created those is to actually create the contract. This is where the e-title system really comes into form. A contract is linked between three different entities or three different parts. First of all is a property, then we have the leaser, and then we have the leasee. To create a new contract, just basically click on contracts, you enter the start date and the end date for that contract, you select a property, that's a property we just created earlier, and just a leaser and the leasee that I've created. Once I submit it, it has actually created the contract between these parties. The system allows for you to upload a PDF document or an image file as part of this. Let's say you want to have that physical contract that you just signed on. Just from legal perspective, everything can be stored on the platform. Once the contract is stored, once the property is created, once all those things are done, we can go back to our original My Properties, click on it and see that where we started with just a basic view of the property according to the title deeds office. We now have a whole list of information that's shown here. All the way from the property, including the contract, including everything down to the original title deed office. Therefore, making this complete link within the system for this smaller piece of property. What this allows us to do is export this data to whatever site we might need. Um, let's say, for instance, you want to have a FICA document can take this information, say, you know what, here is the link, here is the build-up from where this small person's position, permission to occupy is, all the way up 
to the original title deed as recognized by the South African government. Thank you so much. Mouthful. Willem, yeah, um, that is a mouthful. So maybe let me provide a, a high level summary of what we are saying this system can do. The first very important thing is that any community or person that owns a big property or multiple properties can actually see it on the platform. That's the first thing. You can see all your properties. That's the first thing. Secondly, you can then allocate a specific property as a whole property to a specific person or entity. Yes. Or you can say, I do not want to allocate this complete property to somebody or an entity. I want to take that property. I want to create a subdivision. In other words, I'm going to identify a specific portion of that property that I want to allocate to a person or an entity. The benefit is you have a platform where you can see what properties are still available for use and what properties are already occupied. That's the first thing. The second thing, you can of course also use the same platform for planning. So if you currently have land that are not utilized, you can say, but I want to reserve this portion for future agricultural development, or I want to reserve it for light industrial or for residential. So the same tool can also be used for planning. Okay. And just, and I think this is so important to emphasize, what this platform makes possible is actually to provide surety of land. Because now you have a system and there is transparency and there is logic. There cannot be dispute about the allocation of a piece of land because there is a system that confirms this piece of land is either, either available or not, and this specific piece of land is allocated to this person or this entity. We know that you, you currently there is challenges faced with the same piece of property being, for instance, given to two different persons, or even an overlap, or a dispute possibly um, about the borders of, of properties. And I think you, you quickly touched on it, but this is the hands-on approach that this platform also enables one to do, and that is to take a cell phone. As long as they signal, and in the case of Barulong Boseleka, in the area there is reasonably good cell phone reception, you can take your cell phone and you can use it to actually go to the different beacons, to identify the beacons. So when we talk about grassroots level allocation of properties or of land, of subdivisions, this is a tool that can be used on grassroots level. Yes. In terms of traditional leadership, what you said, we said the system must be fit for purpose. Mm. And, and you touched on creating a profile, but, was not, but what you did not explain in detail is that the system, you mentioned the blue zones and the green zones by just in passing. So of course, if you are the head man or the head woman of a specific village, of a specific farm, you have the responsibility to do allocation there, of course, in collaboration, in communication with the traditional authority. But now you can have your own profile on this platform that shows you for the portion of land you are responsible for. Yes. This is what is available. This is where I can allocate for residential. This is where I can allocate for, for agriculture. And of course you can say, well, if you group a couple of villages in an area and you want to have a person that have got oversight over a couple of villages or properties you can have another level another profile on the platform that have that can have a look at multiple areas and of course at the highest level at the level of Corsi you can see the whole area yeah. okay um, and and just I think people might not be well informed of the challenges faced by deep rural communities about to say this is where I live, um, to simply have some kind of a proof of, of, of your address. And of course, if we're talking about agricultural investment, the one thing you need to know is that there will not be a dispute about this um, piece of land that I'm using. Jose, I think maybe I can now, I can now ask you to come in again. Your well, maybe you can give us comments on 
what do you think about what we are going to do at the Banshu with this with this system? What it will make possible for Barulumbo <coughs> Um Barant, I think um, I'm feeling blessed uh, sitting here. And just as uh, a side note that maybe I'm also appreciating being a woman um, sitting here because uh, by nature we are emotive beings and as we um, went about the, the interview now at the session um, I became while Willem was uh, presenting I actually became a bit emotional um, because this is ground groundbreaking um, for our sector it is groundbreaking in so many ways because the sector of traditional leadership is wild, 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 widely misunderstood. And the questions uh, or the, the, the arguments have been what is the relevance of traditional leadership in the, in the current dispensation? Um, so, you know, to me it's how do we make our people understand that traditional leadership is the fiber of who they are. Uh, it, it is their identity. And we need to nurture this sector. And this is what we are talking about. Because if we have a strong system, we know that traditionally, when you talk about traditional leadership, you're talking about land. You can't, you can't divorce the two. So if we have strong systems, that um, can, can be able to also be relevant um, to how things are done without taking away what Willem said, you know, without taking away from the system. That is something that I can't even express um, how I'm feeling now. The challenges are there, yes. Uh, you spoke about security of tenure, um, a lot of the delay that we, we have within the sector is precisely that. How do we want to develop, but how do you develop without planning, without ensuring that uh, the, the portions that you're speaking about are indeed uh, secure, you know? Uh, and so it is all about solutions. How, how do we find solutions to, to make it work, to make things better? for the sector to operate. And that's that's how I'm feeling, that's where I am. I don't want us to dwell on the challenges, but I want us to say we are on a path of finding the solutions to the challenges that we face. I think that's the attitude that I would rather, um, that's what I would rather talk about, the solutions and, and not the challenges. Thank you, Kosi, and I, I think this is important to mention. So. Um, Today is not a destination, it is a, it is a stop next to a journey. Yes. And so what we are announcing today is that we are doing a launch project um, in partnership in the area of Barulongbo Seleka, where we are taking this land management system, this land management platform. We are implementing it in the area of Barulongbo Seleka. And it's a launch project because of course we still need to learn. You might want to do some refinement. Of course, there's a, one can imagine the capturing effort that we are talking about. Because of course, there, there is land and there's activities on the land. And it's one thing to say, we captured the properties as registered in the title deed office. But now there are on each of those properties, there's some detail that must still be captured. And then of course, you talk about training because of course if you've got a system like this it is really easy to use but of course you're going to need some training and and development so yes it is it is not we know that there is some destination in future and and maybe we can say that destination is to have surety of land and to find a balance between the community interest and the individual interest because one cannot say there's this place called a banshu and there's many individuals living there. Of course, 
there is a place like Dabanshu and there's individual persons living there, but it's also Dabanshu of the Barulong Boseleka. So you need to balance the interest of the community to protect the community as a community to preserve, but to also give the individual surety of the land they are using or want to use. And we all know that that will be key to development. That will be the starting point of, of development. So we are, of course, we are really excited about the journey ahead. We know that we're going we're gonna to learn a lot still and we're going to refine, but we are really looking forward. Willem, I don't know if you want to have a final comment. Yeah, I think what you stated is very important. This is but the first step in many steps. Um, we want to work together to build something that can work. Um, we think we have a basis that can be expanded upon. But this is not the final solution. The final solution is the solution that works best for everyone. And I think that's our goal where we want to end up with this platform. Kosi, any last words? Last words. Um, this is, as we all agree, the beginning of a journey. Um, I'm privileged that I am part of this journey. Um, for me, I, I see it as a mission. Um, it's a mission, an assignment. Um, and if one can contribute genuinely so to ensuring, dif uh, um, making a difference positively so to the lives of our people, to, to rural communities in South Africa, to also experience, uh, you know, uh, all the benefits that any human is supposed to benefit from. I think um, what we are starting now, the results will be, well, blessed, if I can say so, because it comes from a genuine heart. Thank you. Thank you, Kosia. Yeah. And, and maybe in closing, I can say, what, what is it really about? Of course, what it is really about is we want the future children of all the different cultural communities of South Africa to live at the southern tip of Africa in prosperity, in safety and in freedom. And we believe this is possible if we establish good relationships between different cultural communities on the basis of mutual recognition and respect. And one way to establish these relationships is to, is to collaborate, in simple terms, to do things together. And this is one of these things that we are, that we are doing together. And we really believe that the end result here will, will really be beneficial to, to the different cultural communities of, of Southern Africa. Um, and it's a, it's a big, pr big privilege to have the opportunity to be, to be working with this kind of things that one knows has the potential to make a really big impact. Um, so thank you, Kosi, for being here. Thank you for giving us the opportunity to, to do a launch project in, in your area. Willem, thank you so much for thank being you. here, for, for spending the time and for developing this tool that we will be further developing. Thank you so much um, to everyone that followed us online. Baie dankie vir allemaal wat online gekyk het en baie dankie, soos altyd, vir ons lede wat alles wat Afri Forum doen vir ons moendlik maak. Baie dankie.